Show us what you got. And, uh, would you turn the mic on for him? Oh, talk about do that? Uh, just hold the button right in the middle of the thing. Right here? Yeah, yeah. push on it until it turns green and push hard. Is it's it green. Right Is it on? Hello? No. No. It's green. It is? Yeah. Oh. Okay, I guess it is. Sounds like it's on now. Okay. Sure. like a uh, permit application for a sign for McGillicuddy's Irish Pub on Main Street. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. I think you had one of these, I think you had one of these a few weeks ago for uh, the wine shop. Okay, is this uh, in the same line with the uh, ordinance that we did for, is that why this is coming in front of us or is it? No, this, this isn't the new this is not the new uh, oh. banner ordinance. Uh, this is <clears throat> this is a prohibition. If somebody's going to have a sign that meets the the existing sign bylaw, but it overhangs the right of way, has to get approval by a select board. So, you recently had one with the wine shop on uh, Elm Street. Elm Street, right? So well, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, I apologize for my. Misunderstanding, but I thought it might have been because of the Main Street project. No. It's on Main Street, so. No. So go ahead, Dina. No, it's um, uh, the village trustees used to approve these because they're in the village. Uh, so now that there's no more village trustees, it's right. select board's honor. Yay. Could you just explain a little bit about the sign? Yep, so uh, I gave everybody a. I gave everybody a copy of the packet, and um, this is a picture of the sign as it's over the sidewalk. And David brought a bigger picture, this one, with more um, detail on it about how far the sign will, is proposed to extend over the sidewalk. I think this is a Photoshopped picture, right? And down at the bottom, it says 22 to 24 inches. So it's proposed that it's going to hang over the pavement about 22 to 24 inches. And then the map behind that is um, the Main Street, recon um, a map from the Main Street reconstruction that shows the right of way. And there's a perpendicular black mark that shows where the sign is going to be located along the front of the building. Um, extending over the sidewalk. It's, it's a three by four sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nine feet off the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, the, and that's important, too, because all signs that extend over the public sidewalk have to be at least nine feet above the sidewalk. So that's from the pavement to the bottom of the sign. Dino, what was the uh, previous signage on this building? I think before this, Allium just did signage on the awning, and they didn't have a projecting sign. And before that, Arvads had a projecting sign in this same spot, but it was a little bit different bracket. It was like a curved bracket with like an oval sign. I don't know what the size of it was. I didn't. I didn't pull it. Similar projection, do you think? Or? I I would imagine. But but in the in the. In, in between those two, Allium didn't do a projecting sign that I recall. Right. They just changed the the wording on the low, on the awning, which counts as a sign, and, and and that's part of the sign application too. But um, didn't bring it to you folks because it doesn't involve the projecting sign. And what is the reason for the sign? Sticking out that far. It's four feet wide. Um, <laughs> mostly for visibility, obviously. Um, that's where the existing sign was for Arvads. Uh, these, it's in the exact same spot. Um, 
the, the front of the uh, of three South Main Street there there you know I, I never got so many comments as, as opposed to when we took the deck off it was uh, well if any of you guys are basketball fans it's like uh, when if James Harden shaved his beard there's no um, it was unrecognizable uh, with the awning coming over the top that's really the only opportunity to have a, any kind of signage that would would kind of face traffic that wasn't flat to the building. There's really no, um, there's really no opportunity facing of the of, of the building. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, we we'll, we'll have some internal signage inside the windows, right. but I'm not sure that's, you know, appropriate. And um, you're going to be um, building the the deck back in similar fashion to what was there. Correct. The, it's 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 slightly larger. Well. It's the um, if you look at the picture, you can see where the deck is kind of angled back to the building, and, and what we're we're planning on doing, and what we've been approved to do, is square that off. And so the sign will be in the same spot that Arvad sign was, but the other. Um, so this is a photograph of the old building with the new sign. Correct. And that's the old. That's the old. Um, decking which unfortunately was was rotten which is going to be replaced with trex decking and like a wrought iron rail that will go around so you'll be, you'll be able to see into it but there's really no opportunity to hang a sign be, uh, any really anywhere else on the building without it um, infringing on either some of the other tenants or um, you know kind of a lack of visibility because it'll be hidden by the awning So the deck, by squaring that corner off, the deck's going to end up getting a little bit longer. On it the front, is, front yes. the corner and the, as well the roof too? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so the, the sign will sit, are you suggesting that the sign will sit kind of in the, in the center of the deck or roof? Roof line, as opposed to, or is it going to the far end once you square? No, it it's not going to go on the far end. It's going where it is now. Okay. And then it will. There will be, I think, a, one more pole or yep. stanchion or whatever, and then it'll square back. But if we had decided to put the sign there, I think it may have obscured some other signs further on down uh, in the building. And the nine-foot clearance is that a. Is that an ordinance? Or, okay. Yeah, that's from the pavement to the bottom of the sign vertically this way. Anything that's over the sidewalk has to be at least nine feet up. Right. Okay. I believe that's for the snow plows. To get the, uh, that's Make sure, sure the sidewalk plow can get yeah. underneath it. Okay. Is the, um, I'm just curious, the size of the sign is three foot by four feet, so it's like 12 square feet. Is that a, a limit of, um, of our ordinance also? Um, let's see, this is. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Uh, so it's in the downtown commercial zoning district, and I know that there's a square footage total for the whole building and all the businesses in it. So they've all got to add up to, I think it's 40. 60. It's dependent on the floor area of the. Right. Of the, so of the I, business. I believe the entire building was allotted. Uh, it was 42 feet or 47 feet. Square feet. Square feet. Square yeah. feet, excuse mm -hmm. me. And out of that, because I'm the, the, the largest user, my allotment, I believe, was 22 square feet. And that's an allotment that was given to me by the landlord, it's Jeff Larkin, and his wife. Um, so you're, what, you're well under that. Yeah. yeah. We, do, we do have some additional signage, like Dean was mentioning, that will be on the profile of the awning. Mm -hmm. But that's just writing. Um, that won't be yeah. obstructing. But that. That will be about another eight feet of, you know, they'll say McGillicuddy's Irish pub, there'll be a shamrock and some kind of things that you see similarly on uh, like black backs awning. And yeah. Okay, it looks like it's a black uh, sign with yellow letters. Okay, thank you. It is black. Oh, it's black? Yeah. Okay. No, oh, the awning. No, no, the, the awning is green. Okay, the the signage the sign is, 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 black. is black. It actually with gold trim. Um, gold lettering and is gold faced. Um, the building used to have a big marquee type built, uh, 
sign on the Elm Street side that said Conti Building and had a list of all the businesses in it. And the businesses were favoring these projecting signs. You can see the two that are farther down the road here have two projecting signs. So the landlord building owner decided to take that wall, that big wall sign down, and that gave them more square footage to divvy up among okay. the um, businesses, which um, zoning just says, we don't care who has what, just adds up to a total landlord gets to divvy it up. Yep. Okay, thanks for explaining that. Mm -hmm. So you'll have some form of light that comes to, to the top of this sign. Correct. Kind of hooks down. Yep. Okay. And it's two-sided. The sign is correct. Is two-sided. Do you add the lights from the top? <laughs> That's a bit of tricky business. I think it comes from the un underneath the awning. I think it may even come and, and be shown, uh, so it's shown up. I don't. I don't think you'll see them. Okay. This one says downlit. Oh, scar. Yeah, maybe downlit. I don't know. No. It's the same thing. It's basically the same way that Jeff had it. Mm -hmm. was... All right. Well, I'm ready to make a motion to approve the sign as it's shown. Any, any... Please do. Right, any more discussion? You're running the meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I'll make a motion to approve McGillicuddy's Irish Pub sign. I'll second that. All right. Obviously, there's no further discussion from us, I guess. So if you wish to approve it, say aye. 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 Okay, I have one question. When do you plan to, be, plan to open? <laughs> <laughs> About 30 minutes after That's we finish. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, three to four weeks. Okay. Uh, we're just finishing up the site work on the deck, and the inside is, is pretty much uh, ready. Pretty much finished, and we're excited to, yeah. to get in the operating here. Well, okay. Good luck, David. I appreciate you. Thank you well, for your time. Welcome to town. Thank you. We'll see you at McGillicuddy's. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. I didn't make any marks on it. <laughs> okay, that was painless. Um, now uh, on to revitalizing Waterbury's Arts Fest. <clears throat> I see we got a letter from Karen Nevin in reference to... Uh, right. Uh, annual Arts Fest. Karen is not able to be here tonight and asked if um, I could just present this. <clears throat> I think you've all seen the letter. The Arts Fest has been uh, happening in July for uh, quite a number of years now. And uh, this is a similar request to what they have had uh, for every year for the last several. So they're looking to uh, close Stowe Street from Main Street to Union Street. So that will obviously the, the dry bridge will be closed to vehicular traffic. And then uh, Bidwell Lane would also, they're asking that to be closed down to Foundry Street, um, beginning at 10 o'clock on Friday the 13th, and then running through uh, 5.30 on uh, Saturday, July 14th. Um, they, they'll do a good job. They always have done a good job with the businesses. Uh, the businesses have generally supported the, the Arts Fest and, um, you know, there'll be a, a block party from 6 to 10 and um, <coughs> everything is there on this page. So um, everything else has been approved. Uh, I believe the liquor license, uh, that's something that Carla can take care of. So everything is all set to go. They're just like the approval by the board to close the roads for the appointed time. All right. And there hasn't been any issues to, that we know of. So things are running fairly yeah, they smoothly. They did a lot better. I mean, the, the year before last, they had a few uh, small glitches just because the event turned out to be much more uh, popular than it had in the recent past. So. They had a little trouble the year before with not enough portalettes, with some trash. There were some issues with parking, and there were a few people 
there's always a few neighbors, you know, there are people that live right there on the street, and some of them feel a little bit put upon, but, uh, you know, it should all be done on the Friday night by, uh, the entertainment will end at 10 o'clock, and pretty much everybody's gone except for the cleanup people by 10.30 or so. Last year they picked it up, we had a, a debriefing uh, after the year before, and we talked about the trash and the portalettes, and they did a lot. It, it worked out much better last year, and I'm sure they'll be right on top of it this year as well. I know they made a big effort to um, direct people for parking. Um, right. Because that was a big issue two years ago. So. Okay. Well, if there's no issues with it, then if somebody'd like to make a motion to approve the. Uh, Waterbury Arts Fest, uh, as presented there for July 13th. So moved. The 14th. Okay, you're a second? I'll second. Okay. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Who, I'm sorry, who made that motion? Did. It looks like it's Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th. Did we say that? No, it says thir July 13th and July 14th. I'm looking at my calendar here. Oh, yeah? On my phone. <clears throat> Friday is the 12th. So it's not Friday the 13th. Yes, you're right. Good call, so, Jane. We'll, we'll change that to Friday the 12th to Saturday the 13th. Thanks, Jane. Sure. That's July, right? Yes. Okay. Maybe it'll be warm by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> right. Okay, Bill. Manager's items. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm expecting uh, Will Bucosi, who lives over on Winooski Street, to come in. He wants to talk a little bit about the tax stabilization fund, evidently. And when he saw the agenda, he emailed me and said, you know, if I can get there around 7.30. Here he is. Good. Very timely. Almost. We're, as I feared, we're a little, bit, a little bit ahead of schedule. But you're here now, and we haven't even started the manager's items, so you'll have to sit through this. A short presentation of the budget. That's not what I wanted to give you. Yeah. Let's do the budget first. Thank you, Bill. are through uh, May 31st, <clears throat> so last week um, all revenues and expenses including payroll and accounts payable are accounted for here. I'm not going to go through every single one of these line items. Um, <clears throat> we're still early in, in the year and uh, we're still a good two months plus away from when we will begin collecting revenues. Uh, I did not print the balance sheet out. Um, I might do that for the next meeting just so you can see that. Uh, but um, we are borrowing in anticipation of taxes now. Um, we're still only borrowing from the village. Uh, we had a $180,000 true up with the with the school district, so uh, what happens is, and, and none of these numbers are on, on these pages, but with the, with the school tax in July, we set the tax rate, and, and the, the uh, state tells us 
the, the school tax rate is a dollar sixty for residential and a dollar fifty eight for non residential, whatever it was. And then you just plug the tax rate in and it generates a bill. And you know, it generates a twelve million dollar bill that goes to the school. And we take uh, 0.225 of 1% we get, so that's about $24,000, $25,000, which is up at the top of the page, about five lines down. Uh, we, we get to skim that off the top for the administration, so we get $25,000 for billing and collecting and chasing down $12 million worth of school taxes uh, and doing all the listing and all the appraisal and all the work. Um, and then on the balance sheet, there's a due to school district that goes on there, and let's just say it says $12 million. And then when we collect uh, the school taxes in August, 20 days after we collect them, we've got to pay what we collected to the school district, and then the same thing in November. So at the end of the year, um, there were uh, $400,000 that we still owed the school district that we hadn't collected yet. And the law says that you have to pay the school district everything you owe them within 120 days of the tax due date, whether you've collected it or not. So um, on, on our, uh, November 10th last year, we owe them, uh, you know, $5 million, we paid them everything but $400,000, and we carried that $400,000 forward on our balance sheet into this year, and we had to pay the school district in early March. So we paid that bill in early March. Sometimes we get a preliminary adjustment from the state, and they tweak that number a little bit this year. Uh, I don't know if it didn't come, but I didn't see it. So we paid the whole $400,000 that we owed them. And then about three weeks ago, the state did the final true up, and we actually paid them $180,000 too much. So they've paid us back, and that $180,000 has kind of stopped the bleeding in terms of the need to borrow for a little while yet. Um, but we've got about $65,000 in the bank right now, so that'll get us through this week and next week probably, and then we may have to borrow again. Um, the other thing that you need to know, I'm not sure what's going yet with regard to school taxes, but the Hunger Mountain Child Care had requested, uh, they thought that their property should be tax exempt so they, they appealed to the listers and, and said that based on uh, uh, similar um, uh, service that was being conducted in Rutland, uh, the folks in Rutland appealed and felt that their, their property would be tax exempt. So the folks here in Waterbury asked for tax exempt as well. The listers looked into it. Uh, we've probably spent uh, $4,000 or so on legal fees right now looking into this. For right now, the listers made a, a final determination for them that they, they did not believe that the property met the qualifications to be tax exempt. So the listers here have sent a letter back to Hunger Mountain Child Care and said, you know, we're leaving it on the tax rolls right now. Um, now the ball's in their court. They may or may not appeal that. If they appeal, the next appeal would be to the Board of Civil Authority here. Uh, and then um, ultimately either party, the, a, a party that doesn't prevail at the Board of Civil Authority could go on to the, the court if they felt it was necessary to continue to carry it on. So I don't know whether they're going to appeal to the BCA or not. But this is kind of another example of what's frustrating about this system that the municipalities have to hire and bear the expense of the assessor and the listers and the Board of Civil Authority. And then when, we, when there are legal questions, we have to pay the bill to get legal answers. And 80% of the tax bill that they pay 
is going to go to the schools. So we're, we're, municipalities are in a position where the system sets us up that uh, we are the kind of the line of defense. We're the defenders of the statewide grand list. So we have to bear that, that uh, expense. And, um, you know, there are some cases that sometimes when a property is determined to be tax exempt, it's exempt from everything and they don't have to pay the, the education tax or the town tax. There are other times that the municipality could make an exemption and the listers were concerned that if they determined that this was tax exempt based on the letter they got from the Hunger Mountain Child Care, that the tax department could turn around and say, well, that's a local decision. Uh, we don't think it's tax exempt for the purposes of the education tax. And if you're going to exempt it, you end up having to pay for it locally, like we do with the veterans exemption and, and other things like that. So it, it hasn't cost us a lot of money yet, but it has cost a fair amount of time. Uh, you know, Dan has spent a good goodly amount of time on it. The listers have spent a, a good amount of time on it. And we have had to spend some money uh, uh, having a, a lawyer research this. So we'll see where it goes. But it's, it's interesting. And uh, I just thought you should know about it now. By way of speaking of the listers, um, Bill Woodruff, who is a lister, now has moved out of town. He lives in Duxbury now. So he has resigned his position, and we have that advertised. We're hoping that at your next meeting in June, uh, we'll have some candidates to bring before you for, for that appointment. So just back up a little bit here with the daycare. Um, are, they, are they filed with the state as a nonprofit or something? Yeah, they are definitely they are definitely a not for profit, um, and I, d I don't pretend to know all the ins and outs of it. But but uh, with the universal pre K that we have now, so there are a number of students. If you have a if you talk to the superintendent of schools, she would tell you how many students in the district are going to pre K at all of the schools in you know the Harwood district. Uh, so there may, and I'm just pulling numbers out of my head, there, maybe there's 70 uh, three and four year olds at Thatcher Brook who are enrolled in a uh, sanctioned pre-K program. Um, daycares, like Hunger Mountain Child Care, can also offer a sanctioned uh, pre-K program. And if all of the kids there were in it, or if all the three and four year olds were in it, and if it was, if it could be deemed uh, appropri appropriately, appropriately open to everyone, um, that would probably make that facility tax exempt because they would say it's, it's just like a Education school. Education facility. The, the gray area comes in, well, how, how is it open to everybody? I mean, first you have to get a slot, you have to be able to pay for it. So there's, there's a lot of issues involved. And of course, um, you can pay 100 lawyers and get a different opinion from all of them about whether it is or it isn't, you know, or how it is or it isn't. So these kind of things, unfortunately, do sometimes end up trickling through the court system and, um, you know, the, our lawyer, Joe McLean from Stitzel and Page, has indicated that it's not quite the same as the Rutland case. There's another case that's probably 30 years old from a daycare in Brattleboro, and it's very dissimilar to that one. So it's kind of, those are the bookends of kind of the continuum of the spectrum where you, where you could fall, and we're somewhere in the middle. So. Um, well, I'm just curious to know how that Hunger Mountain daycare differs from any other daycare and whether or not if they got, yeah. they were allowed it, to be exempt, if that in fact would allow 
it's you know, like your wife or it's because it's because of the it's because of the the pre K program that they're that they're trying to right. that they're offering. Just women do daycare. Yeah. What's that? The instructors have or to be your husband. Yeah, the instructors have to meet certain qualifications. I'm sure mm -hmm. I am not an expert on it, but anyway, right. it's it's uh, okay. it's out there. We've spent some money on it, and we're probably going to spend more money on it, and we'll see where it ends. But so, in terms of revenue, um, you know, if you can see down on the bottom of the first page, we've taken in three percent of of. Uh, I'm sorry, not three percent. Three percent of the total. No. That's no, that's a. No, that I didn't uh, do the percentage of the of the total. Anyway, we've we've taken a very small percentage of our total, about not quite ten percent. Uh, two point nine million is the total revenue we've taken, and two hundred and sixty-five thousand to date. So um, I just didn't fill in the percentage there in the spreadsheet, uh, and that's pretty typical for this time of year. We're through about forty-one percent of the budget season, uh, but. Our revenues are very top heavy with regard to property taxes. So until we start collecting our taxes, we're going to be pretty on the low side there. With regard to um, spending, as I said, we're 41% through the year. Um, and uh, there's no budget that I'm overly concerned about at the moment. Um, you can take this and you know look at it. You can ask questions next week or the, at the next meeting. Through um, the end of May, we've actually spent 24% of the general fund, so that seems like we're lagging uh, about half behind where we should be at the 41% mark. But remember, there are a number of big ticket items that we pay uh, only a couple times during the year, and, and many of them right at the end of the year. So all of the transfers to the to the um, to the capital funds that that doesn't happen until the end of the year. So uh, and then debt, uh, we pay interest in uh, May and November, and then we pay principal payments in November. So that's all backloaded as well. Um, <clears throat> If you look at Fund 12, which is the highway department, um, it's about midway through, and it's on three, two pages. Um, again, revenues, we are about 3% of revenue there. Same thing, uh, property taxes is, is, you know, 15 sixteenths of the, of the total revenue. Uh, we've taken in $55,000 of revenue to date. And on the spending side, um, the highway fund has spent about 26%. Um, as you would expect, the pay line is, uh, looks pretty high right now. Um, but that's always the case when you get into April and May. You've had a lot of overtime from January through the end of the winter. And now we start into summer work, and that over time will, you know, uh, ratchet down considerably at this point. Um, the part-time pay line, I think I told you this the last time that we did a budget report. Um, we budgeted $5,000. that says that we've spent $14,402 right now of part-time pay. Um, almost all of that was a highway department part-time employee who was working in the water or sewer department. So we will be getting repaid by the time uh, June is done. I will have made that payment back. So that, that will number will go down below the $5,000 mark. Um, and, you know, everything else is as you would expect, I think. Um, you know, salt and sands budgets are going to be high at this time of year because we're, you know, we have four of our winter, four of our six winter months are in the, in the spring and, uh, you know, we'll come more in line as we get into the last half of November and December. 
So um, there's really nothing that I'm concerned about at this point. Uh, if there's anything that you see that you have a question about, I would certainly uh, tell you to you know either send me an email, ask now, or bring it back up at the next meeting. The last few pages of the budget report, which is in different font, I, I did not uh, expand these out to give a projection or anything else. Funds 71, 72, 75, and 76 are uh, either uh, capital funds or the municipal building operating fund. We have spent about $30,000 so far on the Main Street reconstruction project. Um, that's the total number that has been spent to date this year. Uh, some of that is water and sewer, which will be reimbursed to the town, so that number is actually a little inflated right now. Um, and then on Fund 72, just to show you that I got posted to the wrong dump truck line, but we, we did purchase uh, one dump truck this year that has already been delivered, so that 119,374 should be up two lines from where it is, where it's budgeted. Um, fund 75 is the recreation budget. Uh, recreation capital fund. I should tell you a little bit about that. At the next meeting, I'll have uh, much better information for you. If you remember, we applied for the VOREC grant um, and we did not receive it. So it kind of had a, a two-track budget for the recreation. And one of the things that we decided that we we're going to go ahead with was to replace the lights after over 30 years here on the lighted field. And if you happen to notice, there's an excavator sitting out in the lawn right now. Green Mountain Power was here last week uh, to help put the meter in. The power is going to be run from over here by the banner poles and will go out to the field there. Um, when we got into it, uh, we have uh, Kevin Collins, the electrician, is, is working on this job. We found some things that were frankly, uh, a little bit uh, dicey in terms of what the whole panel was, that there's probably some um, uh, connections in the system under the, under the ground that, you know, are, it's definitely not too, not too soon to be replacing them. Um, and then the electrical inspector, of course, came and, and, you know, obviously we want to do everything right. The lights, they're going to be a little bit more costly. I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but I've asked Nick and Woody to put together a, a report. Um, and the, the lights at the playing field, they're going to cost more. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to kind of balance that extra cost out because we already have just about finished the work that we're doing in the rec building. So there's there's not a lot of play, but we have to do it right. Obviously, right. we've got to, we, we can't leave it um, in a situation where it might be dangerous. So I'll have more information for you at the next meeting. And um, the municipal building operating fund, that's the second to last budget there. Um, that's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, spent about 34% in there. And again, the uh, debt hasn't been paid at all yet. So we're a little ahead on that. But again, a lot of that is due to uh, winter time. We've paid for our heat and lights already. <coughs> so anyway, unless you have a question, that's where we are regards to the budget for the main operating funds and those capital funds. Any questions, concerns, comments? You know, somebody had asked me about what was going on down here, and I said, well, they're replacing the lights, and uh, I said, uh, we applied for a grant, but I don't think we received it. 
That's unfortunate. But. Will the new lights be more efficient? Oh yeah, much more efficient. And the uh, one of the biggest things we're hoping to get significantly upgraded is the ability to control when they're on and off. I mean, there's a pretty rudimentary, <laughs> pretty rudimentary timer there right now, yeah. and it's, you know, I, I think it kind of, you live there, so yeah. it might be every day is exactly the same. And I always look out there and I'm like, there they are, they're on, nobody's yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that more than once. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I won't promise that that won't ever happen again, but it should be more controllable than it is now, yeah. so. Bill, what's this um, 80, uh, 82, the Local Development Corporation? Yeah, it's not, that's an old name. So that is the, that's the payment we make to revitalizing Waterbury for the Economic Development Director. Okay. So, um, Ready to move on, Chris, to the we next? Are. Yeah, well, sounds like it. All right. So we're going to talk about the tax stabilization fund. Um, I bet these are handouts just for the tax stabilization fund. I've got information about the other investment funds that we have, but um, rather than pass them all out together and then potentially confuse you, We'll just talk about this one first. And Will Bucosi here, uh, who lives right uh, in the backyard for us uh, here on Winooski Street, uh, after town meeting, uh, sent an email to Chris and me. And then I met with him, and we, we had a couple of different meetings and some conversations. And he just had some comments and concerns, um, I think, he and I had a, a, a good couple of meetings and some exchanges about this, and I believe he understands, uh, you know, what the town has and has tried to do uh, better than he did before. But he also, um, because he expressed an interest when I put this on the agenda for tonight, I. Uh, I sent an email to, to Will and I told him that we'd be talking about it and if he wanted to listen or make comments that that would certainly be welcome. So um, anyway, the top sheet, which is the printout from the, uh, the balance sheet for the tax stabilization fund, I printed it out for the period of May 2019, but the reason why the, uh, there's handwriting in there is because the statements have not been received yet by the treasurer. I get the ones that are attached online today. Um, so the, uh, the unrealized losses for the month of May have not been uh, plugged into the balance sheet yet. So the balance sheet now, with my handwriting on it, um, kind of matches what is in the investment portfolio. So. The portfolio itself is $406,390.26, uh, $723 and changes in cash, and $405,667 is in securities. Uh, you can see the securities starting on page two of the Edward Jones printout. Uh, we have three, three bonds uh, still uh, paying a very good rate. Uh, we can't get those kind of rates now if we were trying to buy fixed income securities. So we purchased them um, a number of years ago, well, back in the early to mid 2000s, I believe. <laughs> and uh, you can see, you know, seven and a quarter percent for two of them and 6.45% for the third one. <clears throat> and then a number of mutual funds that spill over onto the third page. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there's $8,710 in a money market fund, which is, again, listed as a mutual fund on the third page. Um, and then going back to the balance sheet, um, the $760,300 that says advance to other funds, 
that's money that the tax stabilization fund lent to the highway funds and the fire department for the purchase of graders and fire trucks and the like. So we're paying ourselves 4% uh, interest on those, on those loans, and we're paying us that amount of interest in order to try to, you know, um, it was done for two reasons. One, it was a means by which we could uh, diversify our portfolio a little bit. That $760,000 is frankly like a fixed income security. It's like a bond. Uh, we owe it to ourselves, so it's more secure than any of the other uh, securities that we have. We don't have to worry that we're going to go out of business. We have the unlimited right of taxation, Chris. So if we can't pay ourselves, we can go and tax everybody to death until we can. So. I'm going to say never say never, though. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, the fund uh, has has gained, um, this says 30500 from the beginning of the year, but again, if you take my handwriting into account, uh, it lost about $8,500 last month. So it's down about, you know, 20, 21, five or something like that uh, is what the gains are to date, not including any of the 4% interest that we're gonna pay ourselves because we just pay that in a lump sum when we make the principal payment. Um, so it's performing a, a little bit, um, I won't say lower than expectations, but certainly uh, lower than what we uh, realized last year uh, until the very end of the year. And then at the very end of the year, we kind of hit, and then uh, the early part of this year, it was, it had dropped down. And now with all the trade wars escalating, it's dropping a bit again of late. And we'll see what happens. So um, if you remember at town meeting this year, the voters uh, changed the uh, formula by which we we're taking money out of this fund. We, we had a, uh, a formula that was a little bit complex. Um, you know, we had to, the first, 3% stayed in the fund, and then the next 5% was transferred to the general fund, and then above 8%, there was a 60-40 split, some of which stayed and some of which was transferred. And after talking both with Bill Iacovoni, our former auditor, and the folks at Sullivan and Powers, they felt that a simpler formula that said, you know, you can take 5% of the year-end value out, uh, up to 5%, the voters changed that. So um, we still have um, the same, if this balance sheet doesn't show it, but uh, if you look at our audit report, the audit report tells us that $644,000 of this is reserved. It's basically the corpus of the, of the fund. And if it goes below that, if it goes below 644, we cannot take anything out of it until we get it above that again. And that's really where Will um, wanted to make his comment. So if the board has questions of me about this, you can ask them now. Otherwise, Chris, I'd ask you to let Will make his comments. Would you the microphone You can sit over there, Will. It's easier. Just make sure that's... That's all. I feel so confrontational. There should be a green light. Um, There's a button right Look here. on the back side there. Is it on right here? A little, a little light green button. Green. That's a whole time. Is it staying on green or no? Nope. Nope. Here, try this other one. This one work? Yep. Okay. So, I when I attended town when I attended town meeting, um, I started looking through the documentation that the bill put together. 
I understood why um, the intent of the proposed changes uh, in that they were intended to reduce or to improve the efficiency or effectiveness of the fund. But it occurred to me that it might not be the right way to go about it um, for a couple reasons. Um, I guess the first and foremost is if, if you think about what the new rule allows you to do, it's essentially just to withdraw more funds. Um, and if you were to go ahead and follow those rules over time, um, the balance of the fund would not keep up with inflation. So I got curious and I went home and I, I took that initial, I can't remember what the initial balance was, but adjusted it for inflation. And it turns out that the balance you, you guys have now is pretty much what the original, uh, would you call it seed money bill? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much the original value of, of the fund adjusted for inflation. Um, so I, I just wondered if there should be some check in place to adjust that lower threshold for inflation so that over time the effectiveness of the fund doesn't decrease. Um, yeah. So uh, um, Will and I had a fairly long discussion about this. and. I did the same calculation, and I didn't bring, I, I, earlier today I thought I would print out the last email exchange that we had, but I got tied up and I didn't do it. I think that um, taking the $644,000 and then uh, going back to 1996, whenever the year was, um, <clears throat> If we adjusted it by inflation, I think it got up into the high 880s, 885, 900, or something like that. And the balance of the fund at the beginning of this year was, uh, you know, something like 960 or something like that. Um, and I'm not sure that it's allowing us to take out more money than we take out now. I think the purpose of the change was to um, to make the formula a little bit more understandable. Um, it doesn't. It, it limits the the withdrawal to no more than five percent in any given year. And uh, the select board, of course, uh, can choose at any point to to take lower than that. And that was pretty. The the board talked about that when they put the warning together and said, you know, we don't want it to say the board shall take out 5%. We want it to say the board may take up to 5%. And Mark Fryer was quick to say, you know, if, if it does 20% in a given year uh, and we don't need the full 5%, we, we don't have to take it. And obviously if it doesn't do well in a given year, we, we don't have to take anything at all. But the way the former formula worked was that there were years that we were taking nothing because, you know, the, the performance was 3.5% and there was just nothing to take. Or maybe it was negative 10% and, and there was nothing to take. But um, the way the formula was written, almost built in this kind of uh, boom and bust cycle that some, you know, a couple of years ago we took out $75,000 or $68,000 because the formula said that we could. And then the next year, you know, it doesn't perform anywhere near as well and you take nothing. So, you know, there's a $68,000 hole in your, in your budget from one year to the next. And the the 5% was looked at as a means to really level the amount that you could take out. It would incrementally go up over time if the fund continues to grow, but you wouldn't have $65,000 one year and nothing the next. It, it would be much more even. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a reasonable uh, a reasonable approach. But I, I do think that 
when I emailed Will on Friday to tell him that we're going to talk about this, <clears throat> I said, you know, if you make your comments to the select board, there's, there's at least three things the select board could do. They could just say, thank you very much. We're going to just leave it as is. Um, and, you know, the only way it's going to be changed if somebody makes a petition to go to the voters. Uh, the other thing that they could say is, uh, boy, you know, maybe we should, for our own purposes, consider the floor of the fund to be something higher than $644,000. And then the third, more aggressive option in that regard would be to go back to the voters next year and say that let's adjust the $644,000 for inflation, get that up to whatever, you know, $875,000 and tell the voters that we're going to adjust that eight seventy-five dollars every year for inflation and we won't go below that. Um, in other words, reestablish the floor and, and put a, an escalator on the floor, if you will, so that somewhere down the road you know, you're not in a position where you say, well, we're going to take out the full 5% and, you know, that ends up causing the value of the fund to be $700,000, which is $175,000 less than you had 22 years ago, whatever it was, not adjusted for inflation, so. I mean, I think your goal is to try to strike more of a consistency of flow of revenue source coming yeah. out of there so that, uh, we had a more or less a guaranteed amount that we could kind of count on with a with a trigger mechanism that would allow us if the markets plummeted to uh, to adjust accordingly and, and right. not sink our ship. Um, I don't know. Is your goal, Will? I think to to try to build build the fund more as time goes on or are you trying to not really to build it i think just to recognize that the value of money changes over time and i think you could do both i think you could keep the rule that you have and the flexibility that comes along with that but by moving up the lower bounds it just keeps you more aware of the de devaluation the, of the dollar the fact that <laughs> inflation happens you know um <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's two ways of looking at it. I I agree. The devaluation of the dollar over time um, does impact, you know, our bottom line. But the other flip side of it is the value of that money in our hand uh, on a year to year basis, and and how it helps us. I mean, there's got to be a multiplication factor there that. Uh, helps us with our yearly budgeting sure you know as well so it's yeah it's a kind of a funny juggling act and i think for bill's purposes i think this was just a after a trend of trying it the way we'd been doing it for so long that uh, he realized that if we set kept more of a consistent uh Revenue source coming out of there that we'd be no worse off than yeah. than we ever than we were in the past. And my my hope when I brought this to the board's attention was to eliminate this in terms of the revenue stream and make it more like that. Um, but again, I think Will's point is reasonable in that um, you know every board is different, and not that we want the voters to tie up the board's hands. The board is elected to make decisions. But uh, right now, as I said, uh, if you read our audit report, the CPAs who audit our finances are going to say, you know, you're, you're fine right now. Your $644,000 is the limit that you can't go under. You're at 960. Right. You know, you got $300,000 to play with. And in the worst case scenario, now we're kind of, uh, you know, governed by the 5% rule, but, you know, 5% of a million is $50,000. You take that out, 
and then next year the market goes down and you, you know, it goes down, you know, 10%. So you've taken 50 out, so now you're down to 900, then it goes down another 90, so you're down to 810, and then that year you take out 5%. And pretty soon, you know, you're a lot closer to the 644 than you really might want to be. So I think there's no, you don't have to make a decision tonight, but I thought it was, um, his point was worth talking about in advance of the town meeting and maybe, you know, you want to think about it a little bit, I can put it on the agenda toward the end of the year again and just reestablish that floor with the voters to say, you know, it's really not 644 anymore because 20 years have gone by. So would you, would you say that as a rule, our, the interest rate, the 4% that we pay ourselves back for yeah. borrowing the money, yeah. isn't that a tad bit higher than what? Oh, so yeah. couldn't you suggest that that does help in, in a similar case well, it, to, it, to it, what it, he's looking for uh, it, it in the inflationary it, it, aspect of it? I, I think we've been very... Um, good stewards of this money. I think if you look at the amount of money that we've given back to the voters, the taxpayers over the history of this fund, and look at what, we, what we've what we built the fund up to, I think we've done a really good job of that. And one of the reasons why we're paying ourselves back higher than we could borrow from the bank is, you know, in a sense, we're, we're doing like six and a half percent good to ourselves because we could be paying the bank two and a half or three percent to borrow that money and then not paying ourselves anything. You add the two together and it's it's six. So, um, you know, that we've done a good job, I think, of trying to be good stewards of the fund. I think the issue here is that um, if you're not careful and if you don't reestablish the floor to adjust it for inflation, you could find yourself in a situation because it says you can take up to 5%, the board has the authority to do that now, and even though you don't have to take it, you could find yourselves or a board could find themselves in a position where they say, you know what, we know the market went down 15%, but we still really need that 5% for next year's taxes. And if you take that, and the market has a couple of bad years in a row, and you take the, 5, the full 5% every time, because you can, you're going to find yourself down in the $700,000 range in this fund pretty quickly. And I think what Will is just saying is, Maybe go back to the voters and leave the 5% there. You can take it, but if you're taking the 5% out in any given year, it's going to put you below, pick a number, 850, 875, 825. You just can't do it because you're eating into principle really that way because your 644 back in the 1990s, to replace that, you'd have to come up with 850 today. Right. It, it's like a, it's a statement of intent. It's like if, if you adjust the floor, you're saying, I, I want this fund to be available to the residents of Waterbury forever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I first learned of it, I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool that somebody had the foresight to set that aside, and now we get to reap the benefits of it. Just thought it would be the right thing to do to pass it on. Right. Well, if that's the case, then maybe maybe part of that interest rate that we're paying ourselves back, a percentage of that, if, if possible, could it go towards the inflationary uh, aspect of the, of the fund as opposed to, I mean, how else would you, how else would you, other than raising that cap, well, I think, I think setting the floor does 
does what you're hoping to do. I mean, the fact that we're paying ourselves back is is good. I'm hopeful in a, you know a couple of years that we won't you know we'll have paid this off and and then maybe we can use it again instead of borrowing from the bank for whatever paving project or or truck or whatever that we have to buy. But um, I think that adjusting the floor and just saying that we want to adjust this by inflation, at least from time to time, um, really gets you the protection that you're looking for and allows you the flexibility. I mean, we're hopeful that the market will do well enough and, and despite you know, the current political situation and you know, we, we weathered a pretty, you know, the, the market went down 50% back in, in 2008, 2009. And we went four or five years without taking any money out because we had that floor and we couldn't go below it. Um, so I, I think it, it, it might be worth considering that. And again, we don't have to decide that tonight. We've right. got, yeah. this is a, a town meeting <clears throat> morning, but. Uh, Food for thought, something we and, can. And I think it would be good to have the whole board here to yeah, consider well. this too. But yeah. I appreciate very much having this discussion now in June, early June. Um, and, you know, we can discuss it again. I mean, if you look at it, we've got 70% of what we would really otherwise have if we hadn't borrowed, you know, if we hadn't borrowed for the fire trucks and the, and the high well, that, vehicles. That, the, but the, loan is, the loan is an asset, so that this balance sheet is showing that, that we have, that other funds owe us money. So even if, when, when, the, when the loan gets paid back, the the advance to other funds drops and the cash goes up. So it's already list this is the true fund balance. Of I the, see. Of the I see. Yeah, actually I, I had suggested to Bill that we should be saving more and putting it in this fund because of the, the power of being able to borrow from yourself and um, it's just a, a great way of savings. Right? Yeah. But, Isn't that possible? But, well, the expenses that we have. It, <laughs> anything's possible today. We've been underfunding our, our road um, the, improvements by I mean, a bit, and we're trying to catch up. Sure. The easiest, the easiest way to save more is to transfer less out. Right. right. I was going to say right. spend less. So we've budgeted $48,000 to be paid from here into the general fund, and we've done that because we don't want to raise that $48,000 in taxes. Well, see, that's again to to his point. That's that's, that's the other thing, and to Jane's point, we're mm -hmm. we're woefully behind on infrastructure costs. And, I get it. And, I, I get as it. she said at one of the meetings, you know, your paved roads they degrade to a certain degree, and all of a sudden they they nosedive. Well, we're at the nosedive part on <laughs> on some of our roads, and uh, uh, that's, that's where the value of the dollar really comes into play because the longer we put those off, the bigger the nosedive is the more it costs us, so to try to, you understand? I so completely understand. I, yeah. I understand your point here, but right now that money is more valuable to us uh, out on the streets and highways than, than we could ever accumulate in here. And it's unfortunate to say that, but that's the circumstance. So, <clears throat> so we're, yeah, it's a <laughs> pretty finite juggling act here it's at uh, times, um, unfortunately. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, the point about inflation was a good one because maybe there's some ways that we could. I, I think, you know, kind of by. Maybe there's a little bit of savings that could be yeah. accrued somehow with better management in a different way. I think so. that, you know, we, we've adjusted this formula. This is at least the third and maybe the fourth time the withdrawal formula has been adjusted. And frankly, I think it's the intent of the, the first select board that, that received this money from the school district, and certainly me, was to make sure that this fund was paid first and it was allowed to grow before anything was taken out. And, you know, the first year that we had it, the, the market went down the first year. So it was, 
difficult for that board because they knew that money was there and they, they had fully intended to use it, but you know, it had dropped in value from say 644000 to $630,000 in that first year. And they were disciplined enough and you know, the, the, they paid attention to what the voters said. And we said, no, we can't touch it. And every time we've tweaked this a little bit, it's, it's been with the intention of making sure that the first money, a certain amount. So we couldn't take under the former formula, the last formula, it had to grow 3% before we could take a dime out. And fortunately, in the last 10 years or so, inflation has generally been below 3%. So that 3% that we leave there has helped us uh, basically keep up with inflation. So I, I think we, we didn't specifically say that we wanted to uh, keep up with inflation, but the decisions that we made to not take the first dollars out was a good one. And I think Will's point is reasonable and we should discuss it again mm -hmm. when we get toward next year. So. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming, Will. Thank I know you. it was a crowded house tonight, Will, yeah, but well, thanks for coming anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> what else we got? One more update on. Well, no, no, there's, there's a couple more of these oh, okay. to go around. We don't have to spend any real time on them, but. So there's three other, three other investment funds that the town has. Um, two of them are relatively small special purpose funds. Um, and then the third one is a large cemetery fund. <laughs> one more. You've got monument and you've got cemetery and now you have CC Fisher. That's it. So the Veterans Monument Fund, um, about $85,000 in that fund. Uh, and that's uh, basically fully invested. Um, that money came to us from the VFW. And uh, they wanted to make sure that all the veterans monuments around the town were cared for. Probably going to do a cleaning job on the Civil War monument that's at the Thatcherbrook School this year. So uh, John Woodruff, the uh, cemetery commission chairman, uh, and you know works at Perkins Parker Funeral Home. Uh, they do a lot of monument work, so he's he's getting the estimates and lining up that work. So we'll we'll do that this year. I think there's also a movement uh, to have a three-way project between the, uh, the um, American Legion, the cemetery, I can't remember who the other one is, uh, to put a, a flagpole in the cemetery in Waterbury Center. Uh, that may, some of that money may come out of that fund. And then the uh, cemetery fund, uh, that's a pretty hefty fund valued at about $517,000 now uh, after some losses last year. Uh, a little bit of cash in that fund that's invested about ninety. $7,000 of cash in the checking account that belongs to that fund, and then a number of mutual funds um, where that money is invested, and uh, that's done quite well for us over time as well. And then the uh, CC Fisher Fund, that's really fire department money. Um, that was established. C.C. <coughs> Fisher was a fire chief in the old village fire department years ago. 
and this money was uh, donated in his memory, I believe, and the firefighters use it for, sometimes they have a member who wants to go to a fire school, um, sometimes they buy uh, equipment with it. Um, that's not, uh, not coming out of the pockets of the taxpayer. Um, they turned that over to the village before the two fire departments merged. It was, I want to say, in the $10,000 range from when the municipality took it over and then we invested it and have grown it to almost $25,000 now. And um, the fire department has a committee that makes a determination when they want to use this money and then puts in a request for it. They haven't, they haven't used it for a couple of years now. But. Anyway, um, questions, concerns, comments? No, I'm just looking at the uh, cemetery fund there a year ago. Down about 40000 a little over from a year ago. Uh, <coughs> yeah. I mean, that's not horrible, but. Well, but it's, it's not going anywhere either. I mean, um, all of the dividends and everything is being, interest is being reinvested, so they're being purchased at lower rates, lower costs right now, and when the market goes up again, uh, you know, it will, it will go up. There's really no way to uh, time the market to decide when you're going to you know, let's sell it. And for us, you know, if we if we try to time the market and say, okay, we're going to sell it now just to, you know, park some money on the sideline and then try to decide when we should buy it back again, it's really uh, kind of like chasing your tail a little bit. So just letting the uh, dollar cost averaging works uh, is a reasonable strategy, I think. Yep. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to sit there and play the market like the ones that do it. Uh, are making all the money, but we're doing okay, I guess. Well, I think in general we're doing all right. Okay, you want to talk about the professional audit? Uh, just briefly, I might put this on uh, a future agenda when everybody's here. Um, the auditors are coming tomorrow, so um, I, I put this on just to uh, have a, a brief discussion. Um, as you all know, we transitioned from Bill Iacovone, who had been doing the audit here for longer than I've been here, to Sullivan and Powers, and, and they audited the 2017 books. Um, that audit is finished now. I don't have the final product. Uh, when I get it, we'll get it to the board. Um, I'm going to talk to them tomorrow, you know, for Chris anyway, uh, maybe Jane. Um, have you ever been, were you on the board when the auditor actually came and presented the audit? I didn't think so. So typically, you know, we have, we have the audit done and we invite the auditor in to come and meet with the board so the board can hear what the auditor has to say, ask any questions that you might have of the auditor. I think it would be in everyone's interest for the sake of time and money to have the auditor come in after they do the 2018 audit and present both the 17 and 18 at the same time as opposed to have them come in and do the 17 and then couple months from now, I'm going to do the 18. But um, the audit that we're getting now is, is much more extensive than we got before. And uh, I don't, I have to be careful. There's nobody in the room except the TV's on. Um, I've spent a lot of time on this, on this audit. And I don't think we have any choice. Um, because every auditor that's out there now has to, uh, you know, audit us to the to the GASB standards. Um, there were some things that 
Iacovoni did, and he just did it himself. So, for instance, uh, the booking of fixed assets. So we just paved, we just repaved East Street. That one probably isn't a good example, but let's say that we did what we're going to do on Loomis Hill to East Street, <laughs> and it, let's say it cost $150,000 to do what we just did on East Street, and it was going to be grinding and you know putting in new base and, and then putting an overlay on it. And if that $150,000, the GASB standards say that has to be booked as a fixed asset onto, onto your financial statements. We never did that. Bill Iacoponi did it. He had a handwritten spreadsheet that was yay long. And uh, he, he reported it in his audit report, but it was nothing that we were actually adding to our financial statements. It wasn't really on our books. And frankly, it doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't really do anything for us, except the auditor wants to see it there. So now, you know, when we get a bill, Bill Woodruff, Barb Fire, myself, we're, we're, we're doing this work to put this on the sh balance sheet, and uh, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> debt, we've always, I know what we owe. I, I know all the loans and bonds that are outstanding. So I can tell you that, okay, the town has, I'm just picking a number now, $6.5 million of outstanding debt. And I can tell you what that debt's for, you know, $480,000 for the Perry Hill paving project still. $4 million for this building, you know, $2 million for the fire station. Um, so, I've got a list of that. They want the debt booked onto the balance sheet of the water and sewer funds, not for some reason the town debt doesn't have to be on there the same way. And, and I know the reason intuitively, but I'm not going to bother explaining it to you. But not only the debt, they want me to calculate the, um, the accrued interest. So our year goes from January 1st to December 31st, and we make principal payments on almost all of our debt in November or December. That's how it's structured. So if we have a $100,000 uh, note out there, and it's at 5%, so the interest is $5,000 a year. So we pay that $100,000. Let's say we pay $20,000 of it. We're going to pay it over five years. We pay $20,000 in it. We pay our $5,000 interest. And then in next year's budget, I say, OK, I got $80,000 outstanding now. It's still at 5%. 5% times 80,000 is $4,000. So I put $4,000 in the budget. Well, they want me to show on the financial statements that uh, 45 days worth of that $5,000 is really in last year. So I got to book this accrued interest. So all I'm telling you is there's a lot of work keeping up with this. I'm hopeful that when we get through it, we'll have enough information about what they want that we'll be able to do it a lot more efficiently than we are right now. I would guess in the last two months, I've probably spent 30% of my time just on these audits. And there's no value added. It, right. I mean, you know, right. eight people in the town are going to look at this audit report, and seven of them are going to be, you know, U5 and, or six of them are going to be U5 and Carla, and I'm going to be the one that reads it from cover to cover, maybe. So I'm just, you know, uh, on my bad days, I've been, you know, sputtering to my wife and saying, you know, when I retire, they really need to hire a town manager and a finance director, because this is not stuff that a bookkeeper can do. Even Leanne would not have been intuitively able to just do this That's kind why of, she got out when she did <laughs> this kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> she Thanks. knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, when when Fred uh, or Rick come when when the 17 and 18 audits are done, um, uh, you know, I'll ask some of these questions. But I just I just want you to understand that it's a little bit of a challenge right now. Um, Michelle's doing a really good job as the bookkeeper. Um, she's not a CPA. I'm not a CPA. And, you know, I spent all of, uh, this is a village thing, but I spent, uh, I probably spent six hours last week doing the calculations of this accrued interest for the, for the village and came up with it and said, okay, um, there's, whatever, you know, uh, $12,345 worth of interest that we're going to be paying in 2019 that really was for the last month and a half of 18. And I got it all done and I sent it over to them and I said, oh, I finally got it finished. And then they call me up and say, oh, don't you remember that uh, the village went out of existence on June 30th and that new utility district came into being on July 1st? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, any of that debt that you calculated and that accrued interest belong with the village and not? And I said, oh, yeah. There were two bonds that we had a principal payment in June. So now I have to go back and recalculate that for that one month and then, you know, recalculate <laughs> the rest of the village. And it's like, it's just make work. It, right. I was just it, gonna it, ask you, it, it keeps day, CPAs in business. Yeah, at the end of the day, what value does that add to any of this? And is it just really nonsense, a lot of is it? it? Is it a requirement? I'm, I'm having a hard time with that. So, so no, it isn't, Jane. Um, I don't believe there's any legal requirement that we be audited. Certainly not every year, but the caveat to that is um, when we get grants from the state. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't mean is it a requirement. I mean, I understand the need to be audited and, and to kind of keep um, all of this on the up and up, you know, by documenting everything every year. I just meant, is this um, to a fine point what you're discussing and parsing out these sub funds that went, yeah, you know, is that really required it, or, it, it, or do you think it will get easier next year having done it once? Well, it's required by the GASB standards and okay. that's where, that's why Bill Iacoboni Quit. got out of yeah, municipal, fire, <laughs> municipal accounting because he didn't want to go there. He just said, you know, what is the point? This isn't this is not giving any information to anybody in the municipality who needs it. Yeah. We don't issue our own bonds. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we're not like the, even the city of Burlington. They're just big enough to, you know, go to the bond market on their own. When we yeah. sell a bond, we go through the Vermont Bond Bank and they get, it's all lumped mm -hmm. together with all the bonds that other municipalities put out. So if, if we were a big city, Manchester, New Hampshire, or bigger, yeah. and we were going to the bond market on our own, the, the bonding houses who are going to sell the bonds, they would want the spider want detail. Yep. But we've been to the bond bank, you know, how many bonds in the, in the 30 years that I've been here, I've been able to provide them all the answers, all the information, and they might ask a few questions and say, well, you know, we think you're, you know, pushing the envelope, and then you, you go back and you say, okay, yeah, we're pushing the envelope, but we just had Tropical Storm Irene, and you know, we had this devastation. We can't afford it all. Mm -hmm. Just, oh yeah, that makes sense. But we've been able to issue our debt. Nobody's, and they, they've all had the audit reports from Bill Iacoboni, and while everything isn't in there to the nth degree like these folks need it, it passed muster, it got us what we needed. So I'm not saying, and, and then the kicker is not only that, you know, it's, it's a lot of opportunity costs for me because I'm spending a lot of time doing it's a lot more this. Expensive. It's four times more expensive. <laughs> what, what bothers me is what's going to, what impact financially to the town is going to affect us 
after you're gone and we have to, you know, hire two people to do the same same job you're doing. You know, is there a way that we can tell them to go pound sand or find somebody different that doesn't require all this? Uh, I, I think that I think that they're probably it's probably required, and and all the firms out there would probably require the same thing. I am hopeful, as you suggested, that as time goes by, you know, we'll just get a little bit more used to this. You know, uh, the honeymoon will be over, and maybe things will settle down a little bit, so to speak. But um, I just wanted you to know that it is a bit of a challenge and it's eaten up a lot of my time right now. And uh, it has to because I, I've got nobody that I can... Right. I'm using the staff that I have. Barbara's helping out, Bill Woodruff are helping out to a degree, and Michelle is helping out, but they're they're all taking my, you know, the lead from me. So anyway, that's just where we are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yep. I guess if we're all set, then we'll take a motion to adjourn. Make, make a motion, motion to adjourn. To adjourn. <laughs>